Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, and welcome to this video with me, Louis from Spitfire Audio. I'm really excited to be recording this video for you as I'm going to be showing you how to transform your orchestral scores using the Eric Whittaker Choir and BBC Symphony Orchestra Libraries. It's actually a first for me because I haven't written a demo using the Eric Whittaker Choir Library or the BBC Symphony Orchestra Library, so I thought why not do a contextual, put them both together and see how they work. So without further ado, here's my piece. If I'm being honest, I'm quite proud of this demo. It's all due to the wonderful array of sounds I have at my fingertips. Now the purpose of the piece was to predominantly use the Eric Whittaker Choir Library as the core of the piece to help shape the direction of the music. A lot of the times you can sometimes hear an orchestral piece with the choir laid over the top, whereas I wanted this to be what the orchestra built around and from. So before I jump in and start dissecting my piece and showing you the process of how I wrote it and constructed it, I want to shed a little bit of light on some music that helped inspire me. So I ended up listening to a lot of the older Doctor Who soundtracks, older in relation to my age. I grew up with the Christopher Eccleston, David Tennant era of Doctor Who, and it's composed by Murray Gold. Not only does he use orchestral instruments, but you can definitely find a lot of choir in the score as well, and it doesn't get more British than Doctor Who, so using the BBC Symphony Orchestra was definitely appropriate. I was also listening to a lot of the latest God of War soundtrack, composed by Bear McCreary, and in those scores you'll find that the music is generally led by the choir, with it being the main focus and the orchestra being built around it. So that was a really important idea that I wanted to transfer over into my demo when I started writing it. So beginning with the choir, which is the core of my piece, like I said before. Now, before I jump into a specific track, you can see there's I think about 12, 14 tracks of, of choir, and it looks fairly complicated, but when I began writing this, all I did is I used one patch and just laid some chords down, and then looked in that patch and divided up each line and, and allocated it to a, a specific vocalist within the choir. So if I just highlight all of these tracks and join them and open up the piano roll, you can see that it's not too complex when you're looking at it like this, but where the magic lies is by how you divide it up and choosing what syllables each vocalist is going to sing. So beginning the piece, I used a Tutti patch, one of the evolution patches that's available in the Eric Whittaker Choir Library, and it's called Breathy Oo. And it's a really nice, quiet, intimate sound, and I thought it'd be a fantastic way to open my piece. So it sounds like this.
I really love all the kind of whispery tones that you hear throughout that patch being played. And this acts as a drone for the introduction of the piece. And it was also the patch that I laid all the chords down when I began sketching out the foundations of how I was going to write this. So after our breathy ooze enter, we hear a little bit of flute. We then have another tutti patch called Dynamic Swell with the vocalists singing mms. And I've used this track to help establish the key of the piece and some of the harmony and chords that you'll hear later on throughout. So the key of the piece is D minor, which is what our breathy ooze drone on. So the root and the fifth. Looking at the dynamic swell, you can see our chords begin to form, beginning with a D minor chord. However, we're not actually including a D note in that. The root's not there and it's kind of a little bit uncertain. However, coupled with the breath U patch droning on that D, it slightly solidifies the key of the piece being in D minor. Then we move on to an A minor. So that F's just dropping to an E there. And we kind of get even smaller and sort of resolve to a B flat major chord with the B flat and D being played. And then the second time this sequence repeats, some of the notes are allocated to specific parts of the choir, singing it with a little bit more power. So you can see that the bottom note of this sequence is then allocated to the altos, singing ooze. i just highlight that there. With the final note being sung in the sopranos with an O sound. See that just there. And then as we move on to our second section of the piece, with all of those orchestral instruments from the BBC Symphony Orchestra Library being introduced, we have our whole choir spread across soprano, alto, tenor and bass, all singing in unison. And I'll go ahead and highlight all the tracks for you so you can see the harmonic movement and what chords are being sung. So we've got some fairly simple chords here beginning with a D minor and then moving to a C and you can see in the tenor and the soprano voices a few passing notes there just to help us transition into that D minor chord again there. And you can see that in the automation that is fairly similar with the dynamics and the expression there. So what I did was after I recorded the chords in and divided the notes up between each section of the choir, I then took each vocal line and automated them separately from one another. It just adds a little bit more of a, I guess, human feel. There's a little bit more attention to detail there. And it prevents the choir from being slightly less static as opposed to if I just did all the automation when I recorded the chords in. So that's why I automated it separately from each vocal line. So moving on to the next sequence in our second section, I wanted to change up the harmony slightly. So opening up the piano roll, you can see I begin on an A major and then I ascend up to the B flat major and there's some more passing notes in the soprano line there. And then we land on an F major before moving back down to our A major and then beginning a third section on a D minor. I thought that was quite a nice chord transition and I can show you how that sounds by playing it in on one of the tutti patches. So we've got the A major. Going to that B flat. And the F. And the A major. Then resolving to our D minor. It's a cool little chord trick I found going from the A major to the D minor. So I guess that would be the dominant major of the minor key that you're writing in. It's a really nice harmonic transition there. It's also worth noting that on the majority of the choir patches, I've got the reverb turned all the way up. And if we check here, the mics that I'm using, I've got a lot of the ambient mics switched on as well. And the close turned all the way up also. But some of the other patches, like the tutti non vibrato to vibrato ums that I'm using in the third section here, I've actually turned the close mic down a little bit and I'm using a little bit more of the tree as I wanted that to sit more in the background and not to be part of our core main choir bit. I wanted to use it more as a texture to help support everything else. So for this third section that I'm talking about, I wanted it to be really powerful. So I've used quite a few octave ranges between the choir. So opening up the piano roll, we begin with our key chord, the D minor, 
before moving on to a B flat major with a few extra notes. So we've got an A and a G there, and then playing a C major before resolving to our D minor to close the piece. And you can see there's a high A held there in the soprano voices as well. And just checking the automation for this section of the piece, you can see that the chords begin to die down quite quietly around halfway from when they were sung, just to give the choir a little bit of space and time to breathe. And you'll also notice in the orchestral sections that a lot of the strings and brass that I'm using there also die down at the same time in unison with the choir, which brings me on to the tutti patch being introduced in this section, acting as more of a texture. And it was super useful just to fill in that space while still allowing the whole orchestra and choir to breathe. And it's this non vibrato to vibrato mm patch. And I'll just show you how that sounds with the mics I've chosen. So that being the tree mic turned up about halfway, the ambient mic and the close mic, just a little bit of that. And then we've got the reverb at 50% there. And it's also playing pretty much the same notes that our main choir is singing. It's a really nice sound. I'm just going to go ahead and add the rest of our choir in there. So you can hear the effect with them working together. Fantastic. So that's pretty much it for the choir segment of the piece. It's important to keep in mind not to overcomplicate yourself. It's a trap I sometimes find myself falling into when writing for choir or more in particular orchestras. You feel like you need to kind of write some complicated melody or come up with some crazy, crazy looking chords when it's just not the case. The magic really lies in how you automate that and particularly with the choir, how you voice that, deciding which part singing what note and uh, what syllables they're singing. So after choosing what notes were being sung by what section of the choir, and after automating it, it just was a case of listening over and seeing which notes would be sung on what syllables, whether I wanted a softer syllable to be sung, like an oo, or if I wanted it to hit a bit harder with an r, and uh, then just tweaking and touching up some of the automation to, to suit and help it all blend together. But that's the choir, and we're gonna move on to the BBC Symphony Orchestra now, starting with our percussion section, which includes the timpani, cymbals, bass drum, harp, and celeste. So starting with the celeste, it plays these short little motifs that sound like this. And you can hear how the motif in the Celeste follows the chords established by our choir, going from the D minor to the A minor to the B flat major. So if I just open up the UI, you can see that I'm using a tree mic predominantly, and then I've got a little bit of ambient and a little bit close turned up, and the reverb turned up slightly within the UI as well. So I wanted the Celeste to be placed more in the background of the piece, while still providing a really important role of helping us through that introduction and it also takes us out the end there but moving on to the second section you can hear what it's doing there and as you can see i've got three celeste tracks here one panned all the way right one pan to the left and the other one fairly central but still a little bit more right and that's due to the fact that i've got three celeste lines here if i just scroll over a little bit so the highest line being taken by the one that's panned far on the right the lower one being taken by the track that's panned to the left and our central one that's kind of a bit more center right. And looking at the piano roll, it's just playing a little nice walking melody with our lower line providing a little offbeat as well. So I'm just gonna go ahead and solo this Celeste out from the second section all the way until the end of the piece. So you can hear that offbeat there. We're getting a higher line being introduced.
Now this is the third section. Letting these sort of waves not expanding really beyond an octave for each line. Then our high line comes in with a nice little motif just to bring us out at the end there. So also during that final section, the percussion begins to die down and we're introduced to our harp. And it plays these lovely arpeggios that are based around the chords that we've established. So if I just open that up for you, we've got the D minor here. And then we've got that B flat color chord there. And then playing a C. And then you can see the smaller one there is the D minor at the end. As the previous arpeggios expand over the course of about three octaves. And then we've got our final one not going beyond two. And I did a really interesting thing with the harp here just to try and help it sound a little bit more realistic to how it would be played. And I don't know if you've seen one of my older videos that I've done on the Labs Charango. I did a little walkthrough showing you how I wrote the trailer music for that. And an important tip from that that I took when writing this piece is just to slightly separate the notes from each other when they're being played to give it a kind of strummed or plucked effect. So if I zoom in a lot here in the harp piano roll, you can see when each note is being played at the same time, they're just slightly staggered to give that strummed effect as the harpist plays these arpeggios. So I'll just solo that out for you and play that so you can hear what kind of effect that has. So there's our D minor. Moving into the B flat. then up to the C. And there's our D minor right at the end. Gotta say I really love the tone of the sound on that harp. And uh, opening up the UI, I've probably put a little bit of reverb on there, you can see, and the mic I've used Turn the ambient all the way up and the close just to get a nice intimate feel while still feeling a little bit ethereal. I'll move on to our hit percussion now, which is our bass drums, timpani and our cymbals. So the first bit of this percussion that's being played is our bass drum and our timpani. And they're doing a little drum roll there, which is coupled by our cello at the top, which I'll get into a little bit later, playing a tremolo. These drum rolls with the cymbals included to finish help transition us between the different sections in the piece. So the first one being at the end of the intro with the symbol there and then into our third section and then without the symbol, just the bass drum and timpani rolls right at the end there. If we take closer inspection of the timpani rhythm, it's a standard timpani rhythm just going between the fifth and the root note and that happens all the way throughout our second and third sections playing the A and D sounding like this. And that's also the same rhythm that our bass drum is playing at the end here. But just taking a look at the second section, you can see the rhythm is slightly different. So I'm going to go ahead and just play that out for you soloed. So you can hear how I've used that as more of a driving force when all of the orchestra is being introduced and I also slightly increased the tempo during this second section ever so slightly just from 85 bpm you can see I slightly slowed down just towards the end of that intro there and then we go into 91. So that's it for the percussion now we're going to move ahead to our woodwinds and I'm just using a solo flute patch from the BBC Symphony Orchestra Library and similarly to the Celeste it begins playing these little motifs during the intro and then taking a little bit of a back seat in that second section for playing some nice little melody lines just towards the end there. And for the flute, I've also got the close and ambient mic turned all the way up with a bit of reverb, just like the Celeste. So here's how these melody lines sound, and it's using the legato patch.
the flute has such a lovely quality to it. And I've got to admit, I'm a bit of a sucker for nice little flute melodies. So I'll move on now and look at some of the brass. I've got two patches here, the horns and the tenor trombones. I wanted to use the brass to boost up the mid-range sound of the piece as the strings, which we'll see later on, take more of the high and low registers. So the horns and tenor trombones were certainly suitable patches for this. And while they follow quite closely what our choir is singing, if I open up the piano roll for both, you can see that there's some nice walking melodies at certain intervals in the piece, which is backed up also by our cello leader, which I'll get onto a little bit later. I'll go ahead and show you the horns patch, and both of these are using the legato articulation. It doesn't get much more triumphant than that. Now I'm going to take you on to the final section of our BBC Symphony Orchestra, which is our strings. So if we take a look at our bass track, you can see there's a funny little track underneath titled Under Bass. And the point of that is just to make our lower end strings sound a lot fatter. So what I've done here is I've used an EXS sine wave, turned up the attack and the release. And then what it's doing is it's playing the exact same thing as our bass leader here just an octave lower and turn down 10 decibels from what our bass is set at. One thing to note about the string section in this piece is that I'm using a lot of our fantastic leader patches. The point of that being is that the choir is taking the helm of this piece, so I didn't want to add too many extra voices, which is why I opted for our leader patches. So I'll just go ahead and show you how that bass sounds with the under bass. Awesome stuff. Now, despite there being quite a few leader patches, I've actually used a standard celli patch separate from our celli leader patch just to help boost some of that low end up. But more importantly, to utilize that tremolo I was talking about earlier, helping us bring in the second section of the piece and the ending. So I'll just go ahead and play that tremolo patch for you so you can hear how that sounds. Kind of starts fairly quiet. We ramp it up. And then towards the end, it's playing more of a chord. And looking at the piano roll there, you can see that that's been automated with the dynamics and the expression. Just jumping ahead to the higher register of the strings, I've got our lovely violin leader here. And like the sopranos in the choir, it also uses some passing notes. So I'll go ahead and play you some of this so you can hear how that sounds. And you can hear how, as we begin that third section, it fades out similarly to what the choir has done before. Now, it doesn't follow the exact same harmonies as the choir as well. It adds a little something. As you can see here in the third section, we've got a C note being played instead of a D, giving the D minor chord more of a D minor seventh quality. Moving on to the final part of our string section, and the most important in my eyes is the cello leader. It's the first string instrument to start playing in the piece. And it plays this wonderful sultasto patch with these really lovely, soft and intimate sounds 
before becoming a bit stronger and turning into our legato patch throughout the second and third section before ending on our saltasto patch at the end there for our final note. So I'll play you the transitions between our saltasto and legato patch in the celli leader just so you can hear how they sound. So we begin with that lovely saltasto. Coupled with the choir, it's just amazing. A really nice human feeling to it. We've got our legato beginning to creep in there. And that ramps up with the tremolo. It's those passing notes I was talking about. Supporting what the brass was doing. So obviously this is really high for a cello, but I kind of like that really raw quality of the sound and that it was pushing itself to its extreme. Thought it was really beautiful. So we're just wrapping up the third section now. It's that final note. Again, adding that slight unsure quality to that D minor chord, making it a D minor seventh. So that's pretty much it in terms of how I constructed the piece and used the instruments from the BBC Symphony Orchestra and the Eric Whittaker Choir. I just want to take you through how I mixed it and mastered it. So if we open the mix window here, you can see that a lot of the instruments are panned to their orchestral seating, including the Eric Whittaker Choir, just to help add a little bit more space. You can also see that a lot of the instruments contain a couple of buses, with them both being reverb buses, the first one being the Lexicon and the second being the VSS3. Really nice reverb to help add a bit of warmth and ambience to our sounds. Looking at our master track, I've put a channel EQ just to increase some of the higher sounds there. We've got a compressor, an imager from Isotope. Uh, really great in terms of helping everything spread out a bit more. It made such a difference. And then, of course, we've got our limiter on the end there as well. And that's it for the production of the piece. I really, really enjoyed writing with these sounds and I'm very chuffed with how it turned out. It's remarkable how the Eric Whittaker Choir Library and the BBC Symphony Orchestra Library blend together so well. And if you like walkthroughs like this and want to explore some of our other content, be sure to subscribe and leave us some feedback in the comments. Also give us a like if you can. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.